Last week, we talked about the first word of the Great Commission. Go. We talked about the mandate that Jesus gave us to reach out beyond ourselves. Any church's vision must always be an outward-focused vision. And as we continue hearing the Great Commission, the marching orders that Jesus gave to his church before he ascended into heaven, we can also conclude that a church's vision must also be a disciple-making vision. Hear these words again from Jesus, known as the Great Commission. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, to the end of the age. Now, in the original Greek language of the New Testament, the Great Commission actually only has one imperative verb. Mathetusite, which, as you all know, means... <laughs> it means make disciples. Last week, we gave emphasis to the word go. And actually, in the Greek rendering of the text, Jesus does not speak the word go as an imperative form of a verb. But rather, the Great Commission begins with a participle, followed then by one single imperative verb. So the most literal translation of these words that begin the Great Commission would be something like, as you are going, make disciples. Now, this doesn't diminish the importance of going. In fact, you could say that the participle form only heightens the necessity of, of going beyond ourselves, since Jesus basically assumes that this will be the normative way of life for his followers. Jesus just assumes, as you are going, Make disciples. It's the normative way. So no wonder Jesus used the participle. The Christian life constantly and consistently recognizes what the famous Presbyterian minister Dick Halverson expressed in his weekly benediction. Wherever you go, God is sending you. Wherever you are, God has put you there. God has a purpose in your being there. Recognizing we are always missionaries. Wherever we are is part and parcel of what it means to be the church. So going is assumed. And the main imperative, the main command then that Jesus gives in the Great Commission, assuming that we are going, is to make disciples. Now, this invites us to consider what is a disciple. Of course, we think of disciples as those 12 men who followed Jesus during the three years of his earthly ministry. But in our time and place, what is a disciple? Well, sometimes we may think of disciple as simply someone who professes belief in Jesus Christ. And this is often the understanding of disciple in the evangelical tradition. Often there's an emphasis on accepting Christ or making a decision for Christ, often with the implication that by accepting Christ, we'll know where we will go after we die. But does assenting to belief in Jesus truly make someone a disciple of Jesus? Professing belief in Jesus is a huge first step. But believing in Christ won't in itself make me grow more like Christ. Dallas Willard wrote a book describing how churches have basically neglected the role of making disciples. He titled the book, The Great Omission. And he says, we have multitudes of professing Christians who may well be ready to die 
In other words, Christians who've accepted Christ have that eternal fire insurance, but he says obviously are not ready to live and can hardly get along with themselves, much less with others. Jesus did not come just so that we would have life after death. Jesus came so that we would have life before and after death. Life in him, continually growing more and more like him. Now sometimes we may think of a disciple as simply a church member, and I think that's very common in the mainline tradition of Protestantism and certainly in Roman Catholicism. If you're a, a member of the church, then it's often assumed you're a disciple. And a lot of us might consider ourselves disciples of Jesus because we're members of a church. And to take it a step farther, we've often been led to believe that a really good disciple is someone who's involved in a lot of church activities. Ruth Haley Barton has sort of reflected on this growing up as a pastor's kid. and She said, one of the great mysteries of my life as a pastor's kid was the fact that many of the adults in my church, some of whom had been attending for many years, were just not changing. She goes on to say, I wondered, how can someone go to church year after year and remain selfish, stuck in their ways, and spiritually lifeless? She says, I've spent years listening to people re reflecting on their spiritual journeys and have discovered that this experience is not unusual. In fact, a Barna Research Group study found that almost half, 46%, of self-identified church-going Christians said they are not experiencing any life transformation as a result of being involved in a church. 46% admitted to that, that through being part of a congregation, they are not experiencing any spiritual life transformation. And so I think we can say that being a church member does not automatically make me more like Christ. Sometimes we might think of a disciple as someone who knows a lot about religion or knows a lot about the Bible. And this is understandable because in the ancient world, disciples were often known as those who would follow one of the great philosophers, and they would study what that philosopher had said and written, often memorizing it, and then teaching others that philosophy that they had learned as a disciple of one of the great teachers. But as I think of this term disciple as it relates to the Christian life, I look to myself and, and, and think about how the fact that seminary prepared me with a vast knowledge of theology. But seminary did not equip, could not equip me with what I most need for ministry and for life. Knowing a lot about the Bible, knowing a lot about theology, doesn't necessarily make you or me more and more like Christ. I mean, there are a lot of people who can spout Bible verses and a lot of people with degrees from seminaries and divinity schools and Bible colleges who don't often look a lot like Jesus. So then, what is a disciple? Well, I like to think of it simply as someone who is becoming more and more like the Master. A disciple is truly, at its essence, someone who is becoming more and more like the master. It is being with the master that makes us more and more like the master. That's a disciple. And you look at the New Testament and the disciples of Jesus, they ate and drank and sweat and slept ministry from the time Jesus called them till the day they died. Jesus wasn't just a part of their lives. Jesus was their life. And I know one of the first things we might say in response to this idea is, well, that was then. And indeed, 
Disciples cannot necessarily spend time in the same way with the risen and ascended Jesus, the same way today as they spent with Jesus who they could touch walking the dusty roads of Palestine. But is that necessarily the case? Remember how the Great Commission ends. Jesus said, remember, I am with you always. And Paul talks again and again about how how Jesus lives in us. Paul said, I want to keep knowing Christ and the power of his resurrection. Christ was not there physically with the Apostle Paul, but Paul was knowing Christ and wanted to keep knowing Christ more because Christ lives in us. In the book of Revelation, Jesus said, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come into you and eat with you and you with me. And sometimes we think of these words as being spoken to people who, who don't know Jesus, that Jesus is coming to the door as a stranger. But Jesus spoke these words in Revelation to the church, recognizing even then in the first decades after Jesus walked the earth, that, that people might have been settling into this idea of church membership or accepting Jesus and I'm fine. And Jesus is saying to the church, I am standing at the door and knocking. I want to get to know you better. Andrew Murray, who was a wonderful man of God in prayer from South Africa at the end of the 19th century, expressed it beautifully when he said, if you want the power of God's spirit to be revealed in your life and in the church, it must come from a closer attachment to Christ, a closer union with him, a larger revelation of Christ dwelling in Christian people. He asks, can you truly say, Lord, I am utterly given up to thee. It is done feebly, tremblingly, but Lord God, I place myself at thy feet again, day by day and moment by moment. Notice the imagery of a disciple I place myself at thy feet again, day by day and moment by moment. And I wait upon my God. And what eye hath seen nor ear heard and what men or women have never been able to conceive. What you have not conceived. God will do for them that wait for him and for them that love him. Dallas Willard, again reflecting on the meaning of the word disciple, expands on the basic definition that I've offered. And I think his expansion is helpful for us to hear. He says, the disciple is one who, intent upon being Christ-like and so dwelling in his faith and practice, systematically and progressively rearranges his affairs to that end. In contrast, Willard says, the non-disciple, whether inside or outside the church, has something more important to do or undertake than to become like Jesus Christ. When Jesus talks about being a disciple, he emphasizes that being a disciple, it does involve sacrifice. Jesus said, anyone who comes to me but refuses to let go of father, mother, spouse, children, brothers, sisters, yes, even one's own self, cannot be my disciple. Luke 14 is some of Jesus' deepest teaching about what it means to be a disciple. He goes on to say, anyone who won't shoulder his own cross and follow behind me can't be my disciple. And, And this does not mean that we need to embrace suffering and hard times. It means That we need to die with Christ, die to the old attitudes, and turn to follow Jesus in newness of life. Embracing whatever comes in life, recognizing that we are never alone, that Jesus is with us always, and will give the power to conquer and persevere. 
And then Jesus sums up his teaching on discipleship by saying, simply put, if, if you're not willing to take what is dearest to you, whether plans or people, and kiss it goodbye, you can't be my disciple. So there is a cost to really pursuing the life of a disciple. But, Willard reminds us, the cost of non-discipleship, it's far greater. Even when this life alone is considered, than the price paid to walk with Jesus. Non-discipleship costs abiding peace, a life penetrated throughout by love, a faith that sees everything in the light of God's overriding governance for good, hopefulness that stands firm in the most discouraging of circumstances, power to do what is right and withstand the forces of evil. In short, non-discipleship costs exactly that abundance of life Jesus said he came to bring. So then what does this have to do with discerning God's vision for Venice Presbyterian Church as we look forward to the year 2020? What does all of this about discipleship have to do even for the many other churches represented here? As you think about what God is calling each congregation to do and to be. Well, first of all, I think Talking and understanding about discipleship reframes the question. From what will the church be like to what will people be like? The church, after all, is the people. Rather than developing an abstract vision of how a church should operate as an organization or what a church's priorities should be, one basic question needs to be, what are the people of God who are known as Venice Presbyterian Church going to be like? Not just what will the church as an organization be like, what will you and me, what will we be like? How will we be different, more like the master by the year 2020? Do you think about that? How you might be different four years from now in terms of a disciple of Jesus than you are now. And how can you get there? And how can we bring others along? Not just making them church members or recipients of our charitable work, but disciples, children of God, growing themselves into spiritual maturity. C.S. Lewis said it so powerfully in Mere Christianity. The church exists for nothing else but to draw people into Christ, to make them little Christs. If they are not doing that, all the cathedrals, clergy, missions, sermons, even the Bible itself are simply a waste of time. And so as we dream, what does this mean? In terms of programs, staffing, budgets. I think one unavoidable quality of a church that's committed to making disciples is actually the church calendars have less stuff going on to keep insiders busy. In order that the people of God You and me are freed up to spend more focused time simply being with Jesus. More time and space praying. More time and space listening to the scriptures individually and with others. More time and space engaging with Jesus in mission. Because Jesus said, Matthew 25, you will see me in the poor and the suffering. If you want to spend time with Jesus, spend time in mission. Churches committed to discipleship allow their people more time and space sharing personal faith stories with each other. More time and space to truly celebrate God's gift of the Sabbath 
more time and space to worship, not just attending worship service as spectators, but worshiping in spirit and in truth, worshiping at home, worshiping with your family, worshiping with other Christians, worshiping God in nature, worshiping God from our beds at night. Churches committed to making disciples free people to have more time actually making disciples themselves, helping others to grow more like Jesus. And please see, this is for all of us. The Great Commission was not just Jesus' instructions to pastors and to people who work full-time with missionary organizations. To all of us, Jesus says, Mathe Tusite, make disciples. What if this community heard the words Venice Presbyterian Church and instead of immediately associating these words with church programs or buildings or the pastors and staff, what if the very first thing that came to people's minds when they heard Venice Presbyterian Church is the people? People who are truly growing disciples. People who our neighbors see reflecting the fruit of the Holy Spirit with ever-growing love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Jesus said, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. A disciple-making church of disciple-making disciples with a disciple-making vision. That's the kind of church that will unwaveringly be outward focused because as we are becoming more and more like the master, our hearts will more and more be aligned with his, which is always the heart of the good shepherd reaching out after the lost sheep. That's the kind of church that God uses to change the world. Why would we settle for anything less? Today, in the life of our church, is a day that is all about discipleship, becoming more and more like Jesus. Today is the day we celebrate each year when our members, affiliate members, staff, friends of this church lay before God our best estimate of what we may be able to financially give to the ministry and mission that God is doing through Venice Presbyterian Church. And each year, this one Sunday of the year, we conclude our gathered worship by presenting pledge cards along with our tithes and offerings in one of the baskets, either at the front or the rear of our sanctuary. If you're a visitor with us, we do not expect you to participate in the consecration of pledge cards. But we do hope that you will be inspired as you see the love and the passion of those of us who are part of this church family as we bring these estimates of giving, not in a sense of obligation as if we're paying dues to belong to a club, but as an act of worship and as a sign that we are committed to grow more and more like Jesus, who is the epitome of giving. Many of you brought cards this morning that were mailed to you as members and affiliate members. If you forgot your card or if you didn't get one, there are cards in the pew racks. And we invite you to take some time to reflect on this. We invite you to take as much time as you need to 
think of this as an act of worship. And when you are ready to come either forward here or to the back of the church and to place that card in one of the baskets as a sign of worship. We also invite you to bring your regular offerings and your tithes this morning and to place those in the baskets as well, as this is all meant to be an act of worship. You know, we typically end our worship services with a benediction from the pastor. Today, on this one Sunday each year, we each pronounce the benediction. We each pronounce our amen, so be it, as we engage in worship and bringing our offerings and our pledges. Again, if you're a visitor with us, don't feel like you need to be pressured to do this. But I would say that if you are a seasonal visitor and you consider this church part of your church away from home, we really appreciate whatever support you can give us as we minister to every person, whether you're here two weeks or 52 weeks out of the year. Please take as long as you'd like to remain in the sanctuary and come when you're ready. And then as you make this act of worship, go forth to glorify God in all you do. And as we come forward, as we prepare to come forward, we'll sing one of the great hymns of the church, a prayer of commitment. Take my life and let it be consecrated. If you'd like prayer for any reason, Elder Bob Painter and Pastor Burke will be over in the prayer corner immediately following our hymn, and they would be honored to pray with you for any situation. Lord, we place our very lives, our hearts before your feet. And Lord, we pray that you would increasingly grow us as disciples. Lord, may you be glorified in the fruit that we show forth, drawing others to the irresistible grace and love of Jesus. We dedicate ourselves, we consecrate, we make holy these pledges and these offerings in Jesus' name.